And welcome to Virginia Time Travel, your portal to the Commonwealth's past, present, and future. Northern Virginia has a lot of different groups who call, itself, who call it the area home. And as such, these groups will go ahead and try to make themselves known in many different ways. Now, being right next to the nation's capital, certainly a lot of these groups will come and hold rallies and try to go ahead and get their points of view known. One group that goes ahead and tries to do that are those who are uh, folks that enjoy having guns. In fact, we find that the Second Amendment is oftentimes one of the most difficult ones to try to deal with when it comes to the courts. However, sometimes people just don't understand that guns, with their history, make up a lot more than what might meet the regular eye. And so as such, in order to help understand a little bit more about firearms and its own history within our nation, we have today the senior curator from the National Firearms Museum, Doug Wicklin, who has graciously come to join us and talk a little bit about the museum and also the history of guns here in the United States. So, Doug, thank you for coming on to the show. Andrew, thanks for having me here. And uh, let me start off by first asking uh, for, uh, what, tell us a little bit about the Firearms Museum. The National Firearms Museum is one of those unique institutions that uh, came out of Washington, D.C. We actually moved to Fairfax, Virginia in late 1993, and we opened uh, publicly in 1998. And since that point, we've been open for about a decade. But we uh, basically tell the story of firearms, freedom, and the American experience through uh, over 2,200 firearms on display and 15 galleries that allow us to uh, travel in time through six centuries. We start off at 1350 and work our way up to the present time. Now, what got you involved with this museum? What made you interested in getting involved? I've uh, always had an interest in firearms. I'm a fourth generation NRA Life member, but uh, part of my education uh, involved uh, archeology. span And uh, from that to museums was just a, a quick uh, jump. But what I do in the museum is basically work with history. Uh, as I like to say, uh, what we do in the National Firearms Museum is deal in history. We tell the story of guns, Americans and their guns. Mm -hmm. Now, in dealing with history and ha handling the weaponry, what's one of the difficulties in dealing with, well, effectively, they're all these are weapons, but what's the difficulty in ha trying to handle a firearm when working within the museum? One of the things that we have to bear in mind, of course, is firearm safety. We treat every firearm as if it were loaded. Uh, we allow the muzzle to uh, basically always point in a safe direction, much as our shotgun here on the table in front of us is not pointing at you, not pointing at me. We work with that, and like any artifact, uh, when I was uh, with the Smithsonian, I worked with uh, Karari tipped uh, uh, projectiles and uh, using the correct form of protective uh, uh, handling material, that was essential. Safety is uh, one of the first things we do at the museum. But we also want to go beyond that. We want to be able to look at the history, the involvement with our nation's past. And many of these guns can tell a story better than any other artifact I can think of. And uh, what kind of, like, what, since you said that guns do tell an amazing story of our country, what guns in particular does the museum have? In, like, if you were to give like a chronology of a few of the guns to show the transformation of the country from its colonial period to the present, what would you say would be the select guns that kind of show that history? One of the best guns is about six feet inside the museum entrance, and it's a piece that we call the Mayflower gun. It came over with Pilgrim John Alden on the good ship Mayflower. It's a uh, wheel lock carbine that we can trace back in time to the Pilgrim founding fathers. That's one of the guns that as you enter the museum, you see uh, one of the guns that starts you on your trip through American history. You can travel through uh, guns that were used in the fur trade, the hawk and rifle. You can go through the California Gold Rush. You can travel through the American Civil War. You can travel through the Wild West, through the World Wars, through time periods that involved America in competition on the world market, all the way up to the present day. And many of those guns are notable. Guns that were used in the national matches, uh, the Super Bowl of shooting, uh, the Remington rolling block, the Creedmoor guns that were used up at our first national matches in Creedmoor, Long Island. These are just some of the pieces that we have reflected in the galleries. Now, <clears throat> with us today, you have, you've brought us one particular piece. And so uh, some gun enthusiasts would know automatically what this is or they have a, sus uh, a suspicion of what they think it is. But 
for someone like myself who has a very limited knowledge at best, uh, could you explain to us this piece as background and the most important parts of information? Andrew, this is one of the uh, finest shotguns in America today. It's called the Parker Invincible, the highest grade Parker shotgun ever made. This particular 16-gauge uh, shotgun was one of three that was made at the Parker uh, Company. They were among the highest priced shotguns at the time. They were produced when the Great Depression was uh, on our land. They cost $1,500 retail, which was a tremendous amount of money. And only a select few uh, could even dream of owning something like this. The president of the uh, National Biscuit Company, uh, we still have that firm around today, it's Nabisco, uh, was one of the lucky uh, owners of uh, the Parker Invincibles. But uh, there were only three made, and all three are currently on display at the National Firearms Museum, thanks to the generosity of uh, one of our lenders. Well, now, for a weapon like this, since its history, it's since only less than 100 years old, uh, it, it looks almost brand new, as if it was just purchased. This particular gun is in uh, just excellent condition, but it's one of those guns that uh, we take very, very good care of in the museum. It's treated with microcrystalline wax. We have an on-site conservation laboratory that maintains the 2,200 pieces that we have on display and the remainder of the collection. We have about 50% of our holdings on exhibit. We can show uh, about 50% of uh, the museum at any given point. Now, this is, since you s treat each weapon as if it's a live weapon and there's at least one round in each one, I assume then that this one, amongst almost all of them, could still be fired. Yes, this uh, particular uh, piece uh, was actually fired uh, by one of the individuals prior to it coming to the National Firearms Museum. We're fortunate that uh, one of the adjunct uh, features there out at uh, the National Firearms Museum is the NRA range. We actually have an indoor 50-yard uh, range that can be uh, used on a daily basis. And we have thousands of individuals, law enforcement, officers that come there for training. It's one of those unique facilities that in tandem with the museum helps tell the story of Americans and their guns. And uh, what kind of um, bullet would be used for this particular piece? With this Parker shotgun, uh, a shot shell, a 16 gauge that would have a variety of smaller shot, would be used for upland game, for bird hunting. Uh, this is not something that you'd fire with a, a single projectile, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps a slug for deer hunting. This is not that kind of shotgun but it's one of the finest ones. Its balance is uh, incredible. This is one of the guns that was made to be the finest that could be made in the American firearms industry of the day. It was every bit the equal of the uh, finest uh, British bespoke or custom guns. This is the kind of gun that uh, if you were to look for a comparison today, Holland and Holland, Purdy, Churchill, just some of the names that would be associated with uh, the Parker Invincible line. You can almost imagine uh if you had lived to see this Theodore Roosevelt using one of these. Well, as a matter of fact, this particular uh, shotgun is on display in a gallery that uh, reflects Theodore Roosevelt's arms library up at Sagamore Hill. And I like to think that if uh, President Roosevelt were uh, here today that he'd probably be asking if we could head out to the range and uh, perhaps uh, try our hand. <laughs> now, um, uh, since Theodore Roosevelt was also a, an avid hunter himself, and how many of his weapons have graced the museum? We're fortunate to have several of uh, Theodore Roosevelt's firearms represented. A double rifle made by Fred Adolph of Rochester, New York that bears the presidential seal on both barrels. We also have the uh, pearl gripped pistol that he kept in his nightstand drawer during his White House years for personal protection. But we have many, many other pieces and in that uh, uh, Roosevelt room, we are fortunate to have the three Parker Invincibles as well as other guns that uh, reflect uh, an interest in hunting and also his military career when he was one of the leaders of the uh, first U.S. Volunteer Cavalry, the Rough Riders. Hmm. And um, what other important figures uh, would you have had as well in the museum? I mean, obviously, since you mentioned military for Theodore Roosevelt, his weaponry would be there, but who else might, what other notable names might be there that we could find? One of the uh, best uh, sharpshooters we have represented in our galleries, a little lady from Dark County in Ohio by the name of Annie Oakley. We're honored to have several of her guns. One of them is a, a 32 caliber Remington Beals. 
a single shot rifle that she used for many years. It was one of her favorites. Her family retained it after she passed in 1926. And when it was sold again, uh, it came to the National Firearms Museum and we have the receipt when it was sold. A little 22 uh, Smith & Wesson revolver that was one of her uh, favorite pieces and also a 410 shotgun are among the Annie Oakley guns that we have on display. So we're fortunate to have three Annie Oakley guns. Hmm. Now, uh, before we came in, you had mentioned the uh, Bonaparte piece that the museum has. That uh, particular Napoleon Bonaparte is one of the most elaborately encrusted guns with gold and silver, and it has a rich purple velvet cheek piece. Just an incredible gun, inlaid with uh, uh, silver and uh, gold wire. It's truly a masterpiece that was uh, made by Fateau of Paris, one of the uh, master uh, gunsmiths. But it's such a, an intricate piece, and that uh, purple velvet cheek piece is just so entrancing. I, I hate to take it out on a kind of a, a wet and rainy day like today. <laughs> um, now since, and since you mentioned that uh, it, it's a sensitive piece and weather can play a major role, um, you had already mentioned how with cleaning this particular shotgun, a great deal of care is involved. For an older piece, obviously, such as Napoleon or even the Pilgrim gun, uh, the maintenance is essential. And so uh, for anyone who might be watching and say, well, I have an antique weapon in my own home, how would you recommend to them that uh, maintenance should be taken care of? We look carefully at uh, composite objects. We have both wood and metal represented in this shotgun. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, we would tell any uh, individual that would own a composite item, look to temperature, look to relative humidity. We try to maintain about 70 degrees temperature and about 50 percent relative humidity in our galleries year-round. And that can be tough in Northern Virginia. We are uh, blessed with uh, some interesting weather variations. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things is that if you maintain a good environment, around uh, your precious artifacts, you can generally protect them for much longer. A lot of what we're doing is saving history. We're trying to be able to present it for many generations to come. Individuals that uh, are probably not even born today, their descendants may be able to look at pieces like this, may be able to see other materials and realize that uh, there was craftsmanship in these days. Now, Going back to something you said earlier, you had mentioned that 50% of the museum is at display at any given time. Yes. Now, where's the other 50%? We're fortunate to have a very nice vault at uh, the headquarters building. And in there, we have the treasures that are not on display. And sometimes we'll have tours that will take people through the exhibit galleries and sometimes rarely down to the vault. We maintain the same 50% uh, relative humidity and 70 degree environment down in the vault that we have in the display galleries. Al, uh, since everything is being kept safely and neat and we have this one rare piece out, uh, how much of the weaponry will go, will come out of the museum and find its way like here at a program like this? We have pieces in the uh, museum's uh, interpretive collection that will sometimes take down to the uh, range for a demonstration. We, we have individuals, reporters, they would like to see behind the scenes some of the uh, aspects of firing a gun. Sometimes we have other guns that we earmark for a traveling exhibit. For example, the uh, Tom Selleck Quigley Sharps rifle is preparing to go to uh, New Mexico. There are other guns in the collection that uh, have been to New York that have been uh, around the country this year already. Now, uh, how long will it be out of the museum then if it were to go on the road? Generally, pretty short term. Under two weeks is generally the time period. That's because oftentimes they'll leave to go to a specific collector activity, a specific event. Sometimes it's the uh, opening of a uh, uh, Cabela's. Perhaps it's uh, a special collector show. It's generally a short term engagement. If we were to allow them to go out for a longer time period, it would be to another museum that has the uh, temperature and humidity levels that uh, we see as being necessary to. Uh, maintain a, an artifact. And do other museums also give uh, privileges to you in order to bring their pieces into the museum? Well, we've been very fortunate that uh, other museums, including the Smithsonian, have been gracious enough to allow us to have pieces on display from their collections. We have several guns from the Smithsonian represented in the National Firearms Museum.
that are on loan. Uh, such as? Well, uh, as you go through the uh, galleries, you can see uh, many unusual uh, developmental arms that were uh, produced when our nation was just in its infancy. A 1795 flintlock musket, one of the earliest American military arms made. That's one of the items that's on loan to us from the Smithsonian. And by the same token, we've also loaned material from our collection to uh, galleries, to other institutions that are in Oregon and also in Texas. We've been able to see part of our collection go out to be enjoyed by others elsewhere. Now, when you send the collections out, would uh, a curator like yourself go out with the collection or uh, do you just trust that the, everything packaged up is going to be getting from point A to point B? Uh, as an example, when we sent out uh, uh, part of a group of artifacts to a uh, museum in uh, New Mexico, we had uh, two of our curators uh, accompany that group of uh, guns and help install it. It was a true hands-on approach and uh, we were delighted that it turned out so well. Okay. And um, it, with everything going out of the museum and coming in, and uh, all the history, uh, it's an experience that I'm sure you want the general public always to know. And so when you promote this, what's the mindset when you want to try to promote the National Firearms Museum? I know uh, in the political environment that we have, some people would be very anti-weaponry. And so I'm sure that makes it difficult to try to say, it's, guns is not a bad four-letter word. It's, it's okay. We uh, have an immense audience that comes to us. We like to think that uh, anyone within... Uh, the Washington, D.C. area that has an interest in history would enjoy going through our galleries. And we've had uh, folks from different lands. We've had people uh, from five years old to uh, almost 95 years old come through the museum and have enjoyed it. We have a visitor survey that gives us a pretty good feel as to what our visitors uh, think about uh, what we are doing. We have school groups, quite a few home study uh, groups come by to uh, see the museum. But we're one of those uh, hidden treasures that's in the Northern Virginia landscape. We have a sign uh, off of Interstate 66 that uh, tells people about us. But if you were to ask the average person perhaps walking down K Street from Washington, D.C., where's the National Firearms Museum? They might not know that it's in Fairfax, Virginia, just off of uh, Waples Mill Road. Now, certainly, uh, if you asked me in D.C., I wouldn't have been able to think of it right off the top of my head. And so, um, now, uh, when is the museum open? The nice thing is that we're open seven days a week, and that's 9.30 to 5 p.m. daily. Saturday, we get to uh, stay open until 7 p.m., hmm. and there's always special activities. This uh, Halloween coming up will be our uh, second annual uh, kind of trick-or-treat the museum uh, special uh, event. We're going to have all kinds of uh, things for uh, the younger uh, trick-or-treaters, but I think many of the older uh, folks that like to go along on that special night. We'll also enjoy coming by our galleries. And uh, what other special events do you like to do at the museum? One of the things that we did last year for the first time was to uh, decorate the galleries in a Christmas sense and to be able to see uh, a 1950 child's bedroom, uh, how it was decorated then. Uh, my wife and I had quite a bit of fun going out to uh, antique shops, <laughs> finding just the, the right kind of uh, uh, flair for that uh, type of thing. Or Theodore Roosevelt's uh, Arms Library, decorated like the turn of the century would have been for the uh, Christmas season. Hmm. And uh, when you go ahead and put this mindset into play, uh, what other thoughts come to mind as soon as you're decorating a museum, uh, like a Christmas theme, a Halloween fe theme? Uh, certainly, what other minds, like what other themes have you thought of doing in the museum? One of the things that we'd really like to do more of <coughs> is to involve historic interpreters. When individuals wander through our American Civil War gallery, for example, imagine if they were met by two individuals, perhaps each portraying opposing sides, perhaps a Confederate soldier telling of his woes with uh, perhaps an inadequately manufactured firearm. On the other hand, contrasting that with a Union uh, officer, perhaps proud of the uh, wide range of armaments that came out of the Northern Arms factories. Being able to bring the personal touch through the museum is something that, uh, as a curator, if I can have the guns literally speak to the visitors, whether through a computer format or perhaps through uh, the aid of uh, a good docent, 
Mm -hmm. That's something that brings the museum to life. And certainly that would be the hope of ev every curator is to bring it to life. And so one of the things you said, which I think really touches upon the heart of uh, this show and uh, museums of all is you're hands-on with history. And so uh, in your opinion, why do you think it's important for people, no matter what age, to study history? I think that history uh, gives us a chance to see where we've been and uh, also allows us to do a pretty educated guess as to where we are going. For a lot of us, we've seen uh, what's happened uh, in our past and we have a pretty good chance to uh, maybe make our future. In the museum, you get a chance to see a variety of different stories. And that's one of the things, being able to tell the story of a fine shotgun, to be able to take people into the past, to be able to bring them into the future, all part of what the National Firearms Museum offers. And that's certainly one of the best things to have when it comes to the museum itself. Um, so no fears about coming to the museum whatsoever. People know that this is the place to be and you get history from a different perspective. It's, it's one of the neatest places and of course the fact that it's free attendance doesn't hurt either. <laughs> there you go. That's, so it's certainly a good weekend uh, getaway excursion and um, obviously you don't need to be a member of the NRA just to enjoy a fine museum then. No, absolutely uh, free admission and uh, we don't uh, card you at the door. You uh, don't have to show any uh, uh, membership affiliation. We have a number of people that come through that see our galleries that uh, see the history uh, that we present and they enjoy it and we're glad that they have a chance to come by and see us. Well, that's always good to have. And so I'm, I'm just so curious to know for my own personal uh, edification, uh, since you have so many figures, I, I have to ask, have you been able to actually get anything from George Washington since he's so influential in this area? Many of uh, his firearms are on display at uh, Mount Vernon and I've had the chance to see them on several occasions. I wish I could tell you I had a George Washington uh, attributed piece in the collection, but that's one I'm searching for. And uh, much of some of the unusual pieces that we've been able to acquire in uh, the last 20 years, I have my fingers crossed that uh, shortly we may have one like that come to us. Well, we can always keep our fingers crossed. But what would you say is your favorite piece? I'd have to say that the Mayflower gun, as you walk in, mm -hmm. when you can, uh, basically get a glimpse of what it must have been like for those Pilgrim uh, founding fathers as they stepped off of a small vessel onto Plymouth Rock. As they looked out upon that uh, continent and they saw what was ahead of them, to have so few tools, so few resources, but yet to have a firearm be one of those is a significant thing. That was a gun that made it possible for them to put food on the table to defend themselves it was one of the resources that they called upon time and again. Mm -hmm. And it's all, in thanks, thankfully, in your museum. And folks can come by and see it on a daily basis. Oh, that's good. Now, is there a website that you have as well? www.nationalfirearmsmuseum.org will take you right in. We have a very nice uh, website that's been recently updated with a virtual tour that gives folks a chance to uh, travel through the galleries to see different things in the comfort of their home. <laughs> Always uh, a positive side there. And so uh, with the Firearms Museum, you, now you mentioned it's on Waples Road. Um, and so if anyone is unfamiliar with the area, uh, the site does give you directions as it well. It does. We're uh, just off of exit 57A on uh, Route 66. Very, very easy. Uh, I would say that the best time to see us, uh, the weekend, okay. we get a lot of visitors on Saturday and Sunday. Oh, it's always good to know that uh, your visitors come out to enjoy the museum. And so, uh, thank you certainly for coming out to let us learn more about the museum. Because uh, I'd be honest, I've never been there myself, and I've always been saying I've got to go out there uh, when I pass by on 66 the sign. But uh, as a thank you for us to you, we'd like to go ahead and give you uh, this book on Alexandria, 1861 to 1865 detailing the history of the region, of certainly the city of Alexandria, and who knows, maybe there's a few pieces in there that might get you interested in trying to pull into the museum as well. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. And so thank you for coming out, and thank you for tuning in to Virginia Time Travel, your portal to the Commonwealth's past, present, and future. Certainly, when it comes to firearms, there is a great deal of history to it, and hopefully, for those watching, you'll be able to go to the National Firearms Museum to learn more about it. 
The nation's history has, from virtually day one, been connected with firearms. And as we've seen it grow and evolve over the years, certainly many people have used it for practical purposes, such as being able to get food to be placed on a dinner. Others have used it for defense. And then there are those select few who say, well, maybe I'll go defy convention with a weaponry. But no matter what it is, it is still a firearm that has helped to go ahead and shape a great deal of this nation's history. And so hopefully today's episode and the ability to go to the museum will show that the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just sometimes a little misunderstood, as can be firearms. But it is education and history that, te that gives us the chance to hope and learn. And so to learn more about the National Firearm Museum or any other topics discussed here on Virginia Time Travel, please visit us at www.timetravel21.com or email us at timetravel21 at yahoo.com. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope to see you come back in time with us once again.